It's that a P, that E-P-I in the Greek language, that a P work of the Holy Spirit. That is that, that coming upon of the Holy Spirit for works, for ministries, for all those things that are well, outside of the norm. I mean, I remember, you know, I grew up in a Baptist church where, you know, there is no such thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, well, it talks about it in the Bible. And, and I remember talking to my dad about it. Yeah, he goes, I kind of, but they believe in it. I mean, because they would say it after the message on a Sunday night or a Sunday morning or whatever. And Emery Campbell, our pastor, he was a ripping pastor. He was a, he was a shredding apologist and, and just a verse-by-verse -verse Bible teacher. It was amazing. And, and people would say, well, Emery was on fire tonight. Emery was, oh, it was wonderful. It, was, it wasn't Emery. It was the Holy Spirit. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Emery wasn't like that all the time. I mean, he just, he just isn't. Nobody is. But it's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's that coming upon. And that's the Lord's will, that you would be being filled, that you would be, He would be coming upon you and often. And here's, here's how you, here you understand it. Listen, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? Well, try addressing one another with psalms. Maybe throw in a hymn. And spiritual songs and singing. And let's make melody to the Lord with our hearts, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You guys, to be filled with the Spirit, you guys, how, how do you do it? I think one of the best ways is worshiping. When you start worshiping, all of a sudden, you're, it's like your, your heart and your spirit opens. It's like you get your eyes off of the world. You turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and hear through the lyrics of the songs those things that have set you free in the past that now begin to again. And all of a sudden, it's like, this is good! And the arms just naturally go up. And God's great. But again, you know, it's just one. God mentions it here. Do you dress one another with psalms and hymns? And I don't mean, you know, hey, how you doing? Well, Psalm 47, verse... <laughs> no, no, no. So, <laughs> Rip out their teeth. No, 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 that isn't the right one. But anyways, how are you feeling today? Well, you know. No, it's not talking about that. It's about having joy and, and worship in your life. Spiritual songs, singing. And I love that, that one line there, making melody to the Lord with your heart. You know, what do you do with your heart? You know, we need to refocus our attention on the things of the Lord and let the Lord fill us with His Spirit. And you can't miss this last part. A part of that is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, how many times do we need to hear this? You know, we need to submit to one another. And, and well, what does that mean, Steve? Well, he goes right into this, and we don't have time to keep going here, but just, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That's enough. We could just leave it there, you know. But we can't leave it there, because husbands need to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You know, it's, it's this mutual submission to the Lord, not even necessarily to your husband, but it's to your husband in the Lord. And, and it's loving your wife as, as he loved you. And, and there's this moving of the Spirit that comes. And you could say, you know, that there's a, there's a hindering of prayers that can come in your life when you treat your wife badly. The Bible says that. Things aren't going good in your life. Maybe it's because you haven't been treating your wife right. I, I don't know. Maybe your prayers aren't being answered. At the same time, you guys, it goes, it goes all the way around, husbands and wives together, and then you could go further from there, but we know what it is. It's a work of the Holy Spirit that needs to be done. It's to stop quenching and start drenching ourselves with the Holy Spirit. You know, how do you do it? Again, worship all those things, but right here, being in the Word is so important. But how do you quench? Listen, I'll give you just a few of these I found today. We quench the Holy Spirit when we rely decisively on any resource other than the Holy Spirit for anything we do in life and ministry. We quench the Holy Spirit when I'm not looking to Him to help me. I got this one, Lord. Well, you just quenched Him. You know, you basically, it's kind of like you're giving Him a little backhand. You know, we, can't, we quench the Holy Spirit whenever we diminish His personality and speak of Him as if He were only some abstract power or source of divine energy or somebody that meets my wants and needs. You know, like that one gal, I won't name her name tonight, I've mentioned her before, but that the daughter of a famous heretic pastor that said, Holy Spirit's like my big genie in Aladdin, you know? 
she all but said, you know, I rub his tummy and he does whatever I want, you know. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. But we don't do that, you know, but at the same time, it's so easily, it's so easy to put him, the Holy Spirit, into a place of, of kind of just a, a side, a helper, which he is the helper, but, but, a, but a, 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 not a part of the Trinity, but he's the power in the Trinity kind of thing. No, he is a part of the Trinity. We quench the Holy Spirit whenever we suppress or legislate against his work of imparting spiritual gifts and ministering to the church through them. We need to trust the manifestation of the Holy Spirit within the body and be encouraging the work of the Spirit there. And if we're not, then we can be missing out. We quench the Spirit when we, when we create an inviolable, sanctimonious structure in our corporate gatherings and worship services, small groups, wherever we may gather, that does not permit spontaneity, the special leading of the Spirit. You guys, there needs to be an openness to the working of the Spirit in our lives when we when we get together, you know, times like this, it's pretty much, you know, it's not the spontaneous time where we have everybody speaking out. But when we're in a small group together, that's a great opportunity to be able to speak and to hear from one another. We quench the Holy Spirit whenever we despise prophetic utterances. That's, just, that's what we got to be careful of. When, when somebody says, thus saith the Lord, we need to hear them out, okay? Because God does speak. At the same time, there's probably more thus if the Lord's I've heard that came with something after that I would question whether it really was the Lord than I've heard that really where I went while well, that was a word from the Lord. But you don't want to quench the spirit in that and just despise all those things. Somebody says, hey, the Lord really spoke to me. And, you know, it's like, well, I want to hear him out. What if he did? You know, has the Lord ever ministered to you? And you're like, guaranteed. So, so we need to not despise those workings of God and how he can in our lives. We quench the Holy Spirit whenever we diminish His activity that alerts or awakens us to the glorious majestic truth that we are truly the children of God. I mean, that's one that we gotta we got to bathe in. we got to bask in that, that promise of God that we are His children. At the same time, we quench the Spirit whenever we suppress, legislate against, or instill fear in the hearts of people regarding the legitimate experience of heartfelt emotions and affections in worship. Judging people's worship. I mean, I, I remember one time uh, we had somebody who was leading worship and years ago and not here in the church anymore, moved on to the mainland, but somebody was judging their worship. They're so phony. They're so phony. Like, Dude, you know why they're up there? Because I asked them. Because I know their heart. And they love Jesus more than you understand. And I, and I shared with them some of the background and what's happened in their life and the hurt and the pain that brought them to a place where they love Him like you saw up in front here. It wasn't fake. It wasn't phony. But the problem is there is a lot of fake and phony out there, isn't there? And so we need to be able to discern and, and, and not just suppress and, and judge people's emotions and affections in worship. Look at them raise their hands up there. Yeah. It's like, I raise my hands because I just, I can't not raise my, I just want to raise my hands all the time almost in worship. If my shoulder didn't hurt so much, I would raise it so much more. I mean, I just, you guys, tonight, again, just like Sunday, I, I it took, Sunday it was once, this, tonight it was three times, like the first three songs, I'm like, I'm going to go grab that cajon and sit on there and just start, bam, you know, because it's worship. An expression of, of just joy. and But you guys, that's what you guys, they had going just as a picture. The fire had to be kept burning. The, 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 the access to, to the holy and to that place where we would take our offering was always going to be available. You guys, because of Jesus Christ, the offering is always available. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, as... The Apostle Paul is speaking to the church there about the foundation that is Jesus Christ. We mentioned this one many times, but he says, according to the grace given me, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10, according to the grace given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Let each one take care of how he builds on that foundation. For no one can lay any foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, Jesus, with gold, silver, or precious stones, or wood, hay, or straw, says each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality, the, the, the sort of each one's work which they have done. And so the Holy Spirit is kind of, is, is quality control. He's quality control. When, when, we, when you stand before the Lord, the Spirit's going to be there. The fire's going to be there. And, and, and what we have built, if we were built with, with gold and silver and precious stones, and that's a picture and a type. It doesn't really mean you've got to break out your gold jewelry and all such things. But he says, you'll receive a reward. But if anyone's work, listen, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through, again, fire. You know, fire is this cleansing thing. You know, fire is a picture of offerings. Fire is a picture of cleansing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into the fire. They were in the fiery furnace. You know what? But they didn't get burned. Here's the thing. We want to be those that are fi filled with the Spirit. You know, that our life is about being filled with the Spirit. And then you die, and you, and you, and, but you're, li you're alive. You're in heaven. And next thing you know, this day comes. The day comes where, where the work is tested. But because you've walked in the Spirit, been filled with the Spirit, there's going to be reward because when the fire comes, it doesn't hurt you. Why? Because your life has been fire. I mean, we're to be those, again, that walk in this place that are understanding God's good work in our lives, and it comes by His Spirit, and it's holy. It's most holy. The problem with the fire is, you know, it's as soon as you get out in the world, as soon as you, I mean, as soon as you go out those doors and something happens, we carry this flesh around with us and we can respond. And if we don't respond in the spirit, next thing you know, the quenching begins. You know, but it's okay because God has an unlimited supply of pouring out of His love and His strength and His work in our lives through His Spirit, all that we'd need. And we'll look at the Spirit more as we get in here. But look at this in chapter 7, verse 1. This is the law of the guilt offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, they shall kill the guilt offering. And its blood shall be thrown against the sides of the altar... And all its fat shall be offered, the fat of the tail, the fat that covers the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver he shall remove with the kidneys, and the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. It is a guilt offering. Every male among the priests may eat of it, and it shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy." And the guilt offering is just like the sin offering. There is one law for them. And the priest who makes the atonement with it shall have it. The priest who offers any man's burnt offering shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering that he has offered. And the grain offering baked in the oven and all that is prepared on a pan or a griddle all belong to the priest who offers it. And every grain offering is mixed with oil or dry or shall be shared equally among all the sons of Aaron. So first off, it's most holy. Why is it, why is it that this sacrifice, like all the others, is named most holy? It's because it, it points to Jesus Christ. That's the number one reason it's most holy. It is set apart. This offering is set apart to point we today to Jesus Christ and those in their day to the place that this is important. This is the most important thing. This is set apart by God. I mean, this isn't just Moses' words here. This is God gave these words to Moses. This is to be holy is to be set apart. That's why they, they call it the Holy Bible. It doesn't actually say that anywhere in the Bible, except for that God's word is set apart, and, and it's to be holy. It's to be held up in a place that's set apart in our lives. And next thing, think of this. God took care of the priests. God took good, very, very good care of the priests. And so, if, when we look at this, if it was cooked, it went to the officiating priest here. And, and he got what was cooked, but it, the one that was doing the actual work. But if it wasn't cooked, and it was something that could be preserved, 
and we'll look at this again coming up, but it would be, it would be shared with, among all the priests, the, the sons of Aaron. And so God had this plan to take care of his priests. And, and then look at verse 11 here. This is the law of the sacrifice of the peace offerings or the fellowship offerings, your translation may read here. And again, remember, it wasn't that, hey, I got to make this offering so I can have fellowship with God. No, you're making this offering because you have fellowship with God. It's just you're, 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 you're thankful. It's, it says... You're, it's, a, it's a peace offering not because you're trying to make peace with God. No, it's because you've already made peace with God. You can't have the fellowship offering and the peace offering until you've had the burnt offering and the sin offering, you guys. And so once you have that, you have peace with God and you're stoked. And so you give another offering. In, the, in this case, it's like it's the, it's, the, it's, the bless, it's the I'm so blessed offering, you could say. Look at verse 12. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, I'm just so thankful. God's been so good and now I want to give back to him. And then he shall offer with the thanksgiving sacrifice unleavened loaves. Look at this. Interesting here. Unleavened loaves mixed with oil. Unleavened wafers smeared with oil. Loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil. And with the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving he shall... Bring his offering with loaves of unleavened bread, and from it he shall offer one loaf from each offering as a gift to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who throws the blood at, of the peace offerings, and the flesh of that sacrifice of his peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering, and he shall not leave any of it until morning. Now, first off, again, and I know we said this a few times, but aren't you so glad you don't have to remember all this? You know, okay, is it this and is it that? Is it, you know, I mean, how many offerings and how many ways about them and all the rest? And, you know, but we have one offering. It's Jesus. And he just covers it all. You know, he's perfect for, for, for guys like me or, or the world of ADD that we live in where there's so many people that have ADD or, or they, you know, they're, they're just busy. Like, you know, when I was a kid, you were, you were busy. These days you've got ADD, you know, or ADHD. And then, I, then there's HGTV, you know, and then and all these different, you know, it's HGTV. Some of you get it. Sorry, you know. And then there's the home shopping. You guys, there's all these things that God has given us in our lives that we're, think about it this way. He gives these offerings and he says, I want you to, to take these offerings smeared with oil, mixed with oil, one loaf from each offering given as a gift to the Lord. There's going to be blood from the flesh offering that is going to be shared as well, and that's going to be placed upon the altar. It's going to be eaten on the day of its offering. And note here, he shall not leave any of it till the morning. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, when we have peace with God, it's all because God has provided that peace again, so we're thankful. And his son remembering Jesus, is, is the substance of the peace offering. He is the bread. Remember, he said, I'm the bread that comes from heaven. He, he's the bread of life. And so we have the Son, the bread of life, and then we have the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, His Spirit, that is upon Him, right? Jesus, the bread of life, the Holy Spirit, pictured and typified as oil all throughout the Bible in so many places, if not all, you could even say, but probably most all. But I look at this and I think, so you got bread and oil. All right? Now, what's the most important part of the bread and the oil together? If somebody put a, blade, a plate of bread and oil in front of you, what's the most important part? The bread. Hey, thank you, my wife. There you go. 50 Bible points for, for my wife. You get them when you get to heaven and uh, collect there. But the bread is the most important part because what are you going to do with the oil? It's like, oh, oil. Oh, oh, you know, oh, this is wonderful. Could I have another plate of oil <laughs> to dip my fingers in? Because I have no bread. No, you need bread. Right? Courtney would tell you that. She's a baker. What's the most important part? I'm surprised she didn't just say bread. <laughs> it's like, and if you've ever had Courtney's bread oh my gosh I hear they're having the maybe I don't know but anyways but all that to say this just a thought 
it's the, the, the oil that enhances the bread. It's not vice versa. It doesn't mean the oil is any less important. It just, it enhances that which is, well, listen, the Holy Spirit, all through the Word, He's always pointing us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's always pointing us to Jesus. He's never pointing us to Himself. He's there to direct us to, to our Savior. That's what the Holy Spirit does. His job. And you think, well, that's bummer, you know? The third part of the, of the Trinity, you know? It's like, yeah, He's the one that points to the, the Spirit and the Father, you know? Like, no, listen, the Father even points to the Son. He directs us to the Son. Does it mean the Father is less than the Son? No, He's the Father, you know? The, and then there's the, the Holy Spirit. Is he, is he better than the Father? No, He's the Son. But is He less? No, He's God, the Son. At the same time, the Holy Spirit, when you look at the work of the Holy Spirit, it's, you know what, what I see as I think about it, as He points us to Jesus and comforts and lifts us up without ever, you know, He doesn't desire our adoration. There's, there's a lot of songs that are about worshiping the Holy Spirit. And, and I, I think that really they're kind of biblically a little bit inaccurate. doesn't mean that we can't praise God and praise the Spirit and, and whatever, but I think when you focus so much attention on the Holy Spirit, it's kind of like it takes away from the work that the Holy Spirit does all throughout the Bible. points us to Jesus. And you guys, again, all parts of the Trinity, all equal, but again, the oil enhances the bread, and I love this. When you bring your unleavened loaves, if you've got wafers, smear them with oil. If you've got fine flour, you know, mix it with oil. You know, whatever it is in this place, each of those that shall have oil upon it, and again, just that picture of Jesus and the Spirit. It's what we need. It's what we need. And, and look at verse 16, he says, but if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow offering or a free will offering, so it, it could be just a thanksgiving thing, but now here it's part of the, the peace offering would be you're coming for fellowship and, and thank, thanking God for his fellowship and you're making a vow at the same time. You're making a promise, you're making a commitment to the Lord for some, some part of your life, a free will offering, just thanking God for what he's given. And then he says, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice and on the next day what remains shall be eaten. So when we look at the, the difference between the peace offering here with that's just for, for fellowship and thanksgiving and then the peace offering that is a vow or a free will offering, the first is that he shall not leave any of it till the morning. You eat it all on the day of the offering. None is left till the morning. But when it comes to the free will offering and the vow, there you can be it can be eaten on the next day as well. But what remains of the flesh, verse 17, of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned up with the fire. And so it's like you can go two days of enjoying this offering because remembering, you know, the peace offering, the fellowship offering can be the bread and can also be an animal. But as you look at it, it's, 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 a, it's a time of, of fellowship with God and a time of fellowship with the priest that you brought the sacrifice to because they're sharing in it and, and you're getting to enjoy it as well. But on the third day, no way. It's all going to be eaten or it all has to be burned. And again, you think about, you know, God is serious about our holiness. He, he's serious about our holiness. And some people think, well, that's just not fair, you know. It's like, well, no, it is fair. And we just read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, where that offering that's going to be laid on the foundation, it's got to be good. If it's going to last, it's going to be good. It's going to be of precious gold or silver or precious stones. And, but if it's wood, hay, and stubble... It's going to be burned. And God, you see, he's just, God is concerned. If you look at it, really, it all comes down to he's very concerned about our holiness. He's concerned about keeping us clean. Look at verse 19. He bears witness, or verse 18, actually, here. It says, if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering is eaten on the third day, he who offers it will not be accepted. Again, that's kind of, well, no. Neither shall it be credited to him. Well, I brought an offering, but no, that doesn't credit you because it wasn't taken care of in the first two days. He says, it is tainted, and he who eats of it shall bear his iniquity. Well, how is that fair? 
You can eat it on the first day and the second day, but not on the third day. And the first one you can eat on the first day, but not on the second day. It's like, how is that not fair? You know why? I mean, I can't explain all the reasons behind all of this to you. I mean, some of them, I believe, were for, for food safety reasons. After three days and the meat's been sitting around, maybe it wasn't so safe. I don't know. It seems a lot of the dietary laws for the Jews that God gives in Leviticus that we'll be seeing coming up, that there were protection for them later on in the years when we look at the bubonic plagues and other the bubonic plague and others that have come around this earth where Jews were saved from them because of their diet. And but but here look. You think it's not fair, but God told them. God told them, here's how I want it. But that's not fair. Well, how is it not fair? He's told you what he wants. He's given you opportunity to give and to live in the way that he has ordained and he's God. And it's the same thing today with our offerings and how we give and how we live. Well, I want to live my way. Well, no. God that created you has given you a way to live and he's offered you the, explain, the, the directions and the instructions here. And it's fair because he's told us. I mean, he's God. He doesn't have to do anything with this, but he's given us his grace and he's given us his son. And look at verse 20, 20, uh, 19. The flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. Well, that makes sense. It shall be burned up with the fire. If it's unclean, it probably shouldn't be eaten. There's no five-second law. Here's the deal, you know, okay? He says, all who, and again, it will be burned up with the fire, right? Anything that's touched, anything unclean. All who are clean may eat flesh. But the person who eats the flesh of the sacrifice of the Lord's peace offerings, while an uncleanness is on him, that person shall be cut off from his people. Now, we'll read about what makes someone clean and unclean in the coming chapters as we get more into the law. But he goes on to say, And if anyone touches an unclean thing, whether human uncleanness, I don't even want to think about what that might be, but you touched it, you know? or an unclean beast, or an unclean detestable creature, and then he eats some flesh from the sacrifice of the Lord's peace offerings, that person shall be cut off from his people. Why? Again, because God is serious, and he's given us the understanding of what is right, what is wrong, what to eat, and what not to eat in this case. It's as simple as that. Don't be drunk with wine. Well, why? Well, because God said so. And he, and he told you why. It's dissipation. And he's given you the, 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 that which you should be drinking and, and being fulfilled in, that you should be, as it speaks about in the Song of Solomon, you know, vibing deeply, this, that kind of dice, immersed in the Holy Spirit. So he tells us what to do, and people say, ah, I don't like being told what to do. But he's telling you what to do that's good for you. I mean, what amazes me most is when you run into Christians that are in that place. That, oh, don't tell me what to do. And you're just trying to tell them, sharing with a heart that loves them, here's what you should do. Don't touch the fire, you will be burned. You know, it's like, but I want to touch the fire. But verse 22, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel. And here's what I want you to say. You shall eat no fat. No fat of ox or sheep or goat. The fat of an animal that dies of itself and the fat of one that is torn by a beast. So you just find an animal that's just walking down the road and got old, boom, died, you know. Or a roadkill, one that's been torn by the beast, may be put to any other use, but on no account shall you eat it. You know, I mean, so you... You can use the fat. They could use the fat for all kinds of different things that they would use animal parts for. I mean, for us today, it's like, oh, an animal. Like, oh, hey, there's something here we can use, you know? God says, okay, you can use it for whatever you want, but you just can't eat it. You know? And for good reason, too, when you think about it. For every reason, for, I'm sorry, for every person, verse 25, for every person who eats of the fat of an animal of which a food offering may be made to the Lord, he shall be cut off from his people. And God has made it very clear the fat belongs to him. Moreover, you shall eat no blood, whatever, whether a fowl or animal in any of your dwelling places, whoever eats any blood, that person shall be cut off from 
his people. And so you're not to eat any fat. We've addressed that already a few times. We'll see it coming up here again. But also here we're reading, you shall eat no blood. You eat of the blood, any blood. That person will be cut off. In, in uh, chapter 17, verse 11, the Lord tells us, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by life. And so again, all pointing to Jesus, the ultimate life and the ultimate sacrifice and by his blood. But life is in the blood, very clear. And why does God say he doesn't want no eating of blood and drinking of blood? Well, partly because, you know, life is in the blood and, and life is not ours to take Life is not ours to enjoy of another. You cannot partake in pagan rituals and even still today, some in satanic worship will drink the blood of a beast or an animal or a human being and, and it represents them taking in the life of that animal then. And now I've received the life of that animal as, as I've killed this, this, this deer and then I'm going to give it to this as an offering to my gods and, and they would drink the blood. Now I have the strength of the deer because the life of the deer is in me. And the same thing, as I said, happens in satanic rituals. And don't you know, God knew it was happening then. He knew it would be happening now. He understood that. And so he said, you know, I don't want you to drink the blood. You stay away from the blood. Now, in John chapter 6, it's pretty interesting because in John chapter 6, it all points to Jesus, but you can turn there now if you want. John chapter 6, keep your place here, verse 47. John chapter 6, verse 47. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died, and this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then, they were there disputed among themselves. They're saying, how can this be? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so Jesus said to them, I mean, it's like, you know, I don't you love it? How can this man, how can he say, give us his flesh to eat? You know, and they're looking at him, huh? And he's like, you think that's good? He says, truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up in the last day. For my, bless, my flesh is true food and my blood is true, true drink. And whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And as the living Father sent me, I live because the Father because of the Father. And so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread that the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And so Jesus tells him, my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. You guys, the only, the only blood sacrifice that we are to partake blood of Jesus Christ. All those animals were to point to Jesus Christ. When we partake of communion, it's, and we take that little cup of juice, you know, in some places they use wine or whatever, you know, but there's, there's a picture in that for us. You know, the Lord has told us, and when you do this, remember me. He didn't say, when, and when you drink this cup, you know, I'm gonna, I'm, it's going to become my blood and, and now I'm going to be inside of you and you're going to have my life because you literally drank my blood. No, it's all pictures and types and it's pointing to the work that God wants to do in us as we open our hearts to Him and we understand He is the bread from heaven. I'm, I'm empty without Him. I have no life. I need something that's real life and His blood is real life. And as we take that cup, it's a picture of what we do as we receive Christ. And the blood of Christ then dwells in us. And, I, and you guys, and I think about it this way too. You know, there's, no, there's, nothing, there's nothing greater than the blood of Jesus Christ. 
You know, for those, I talked to somebody the other day and they were talking about, oh, it must be nice to have family here, you know, and this and that. And, you know, and, and I said, you got family here. Like, well, no, I didn't know. You got family here. You're a church family. Well, I know. Listen, I said, listen, is your family, and I know them, and I know that their family isn't saved. Is your family saved? Well, no, you know they're not saved. Well, listen, we are closer by the blood of Jesus Christ than we are by the blood of, of mom and dad. His blood is eternal. His blood has life. Their blood, it gave us life, but we need that second life. We need to be born again. And so again, you guys, God made it really clear. He made it straight. You eat the blood, you eat the fat, you're going to be cut off from the people. Because those things, again, were not for them. And watch, look at verse 28. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever offers the sacrifice of his peace offering to the Lord shall bring his own offering to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offerings. And his own hands shall bring the Lord's food offerings. And so again, you bring it with your own hands. The animal would be brought with your own hands. You bring that lamb in, whatever the animal was that was, that was, that was pure and whole and, and without spot or blemish. And you bring that animal in, it would be inspected. And then you would lay your hands on the head of that animal, picturing your identification with it, picturing the transference of your sin there upon it. And then you, in most cases, you would slit the throat of that little innocent animal. And its blood would be let out. Four to seven gallons of blood in a normal sized sheep that would be brought. Twelve to fourteen gallons of blood in an ox. And you would be there taking part of draining the blood from that animal with the priest that would be helping you. And then the portions would be identified and the pieces given to the Lord. It would be cut up by the priest. You guys, and it was, it, but this is identified with you. It's like you being given over to God. So with his own hands, you guys, you, that's why you can't come to, come to Christ and go to heaven because your grandma's a Christian or because your parents are Christians or anything like that. Or because you go to the right church. It's because you have come to Christ with your own hand. You put your own hand out and, and sought Him. And watch this. This is beautiful here. He says, He shall bring the fat with the breast, and the breast may be waved as a wave offering before the Lord. And the priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons. It's a wave offering. Now, with a wave offering, it's interesting because the wave offering is, one of the things that I just read was that by this old rabbi that was that the wave offering would be taken and given to the, put in the hands. You've got this, this breast of this animal here and, you, and you, you take it in your hands and you go and you give it to the priest. And the priest would come under your hands as, as you would be holding this wave offering and then it would they and then together you would raise your hands up holding it together and then you would take your hands all the way down to the ground all the way down to the ground like this and then you'd bring it back up and then you take it to the side and to the side what is that it's a cross it's a, the wave offering is this beautiful picture of it Lord, this is from you. Thank you so much. I mean, the cross, it's just, it's awesome. And, you, and it was something that had to be done with the priest. And the priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the priest, but the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons. And the right thigh you shall give to the priest as a contribution from the sacrifice of your peace offerings. Whoever among the sons of Aaron, verse 33, offers the blood of, the blood of a peace offering and the fat that shall have the right thigh for a portion. For the breast is that is waved and the, and the thigh that is contributed, he says, I have taken from the people of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings and I have given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel. And this is the portion of Aaron and his sons from the Lord's food offerings. From the day they were presented to serve them as priests of the Lord, the Lord commanded this to be given them by the people of Israel from the day that he anointed them it is a perpetual due throughout their generations. And so, a couple of things there. One is that Aaron and his sons were, were given these offerings. 
We know Aaron, Aaron and his sons, as they were anointed by God, and we'll see that coming up, their consecration next week. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, they, they brought false fire before the Lord. They worshipped outside of the guidelines, and it seems from the text, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, it seems like they maybe were drinking as well. I mean, it's, it's, I, I believe it's implied pretty clearly. And they'd offered this, this bad fire, strange fire to the Lord. You know, these were the same guys that were they're bringing the picture of the cross. You know, the wave offering. Here we go. Yeah, okay, now this is good. And we'll take our portion, you take yours. And doing everything right, seemingly so. But then, because of a little bit of alcohol, again, the fire, they were consumed by fire. Fire came out and consumed them. And so, again, that picture that, you know, and, and I, we're, it's funny because on the way down here this evening, we were listening to Pastor Chuck, and he was teaching out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and I and I told Kim that's and then he started talking about Nadab and Abihu and I go that's everything that I got in my notes sir from the for tonight and uh, you guys and that's how that's and it's not coincidence it's it's God's plan it's God I I believe it's God saying you know what we need to hear this we need to understand that that God takes his offerings serious completely serious and if he, and these these things that are written here, Paul tells us in, in 1 Corinthians, you know where I'm going, I'm going, these things were written as examples and are warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages have come. And if God's word is true, and 1 Corinthians 10, 11 there is true, then we've got some examples and warnings here before us as well. Examples of what to do and warnings of what not to do. And again, he says, I love it, he says, these things are perpetual due to the sons of Aaron, to the priesthood throughout their generations. And so God is always going to provide for his priests. It's a perpetual uh, due throughout their generations. It's what the Lord had commanded to be given from the day that he anointed his priests. I'm going to take care of you. The day that you are anointed by God, he's promised he's going to take care of you. We are a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood. And you guys, God's going to take care of us. And interesting as well that the care of the priests would come from those that they cared for. That's the way that God worked it. But again, even as we see Nadab and Abihu and the sons of Eli later, they worked it. They worked it. God worked it so that the priests would be taken care of, but they take advantage of what God has done as we look at the text in the Bible and we see it happening today in the family of God in churches too often as well. And so verse 32, 37 this is the law of the burn offering, of the grain offering, of the sin offering, of the guilt offering, and of the ordination offering, and of the peace offering. Well, wait a minute. We didn't look at the ordination offering. What's that? You know, well, that's the what we're going to see next week with Aaron and his sons. And they're uh, the garments and the anointing of the congregation, and they together. And so the Lord commanded Moses on Mount Sinai these things on the day that he commanded the people of Israel to bring their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. And it's the same thing that the Lord calls us to. He calls us, bring your offerings. He first, though, accept mine. The Lord would say, would you accept my offering? You know, I so loved the world that I gave my only son. Would you accept my offering? If you'll accept my offering, well then, then bring your offerings. And it's the thing is, when you truly accept the offering of Christ that's been given in God and, and understood by the Spirit together in our lives, you want to give. You want to give. And, and, and where do we give? We give in this wilderness. They gave in the wilderness of Sinai. They brought their offerings. We, we, we give and we bring our offerings in this world right now. But again, that wasn't, the wilderness wasn't home for them, right? you guys, and this isn't home for us. And so we have the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, the sin offerings, the guilt offerings, the, the peace offerings. And in that, oh, what time are we at? Oh, perfect. We've got just a minute. I'm just going to read these things to you. Just the, the fulfillment. I kind of looked up some verses that went well with, I felt. But too cool. 
Jesus, how he's, we talked about it as we entered into the beginning of Leviticus, the book of holiness, it's a book of holiness all out. God calling his people to be holy as he is holy, right? Jesus is holy, so be holy as he's holy. Jesus has fulfilled all of these sacrifices in this system that we've seen. In Hebrews 10, 12, we're told, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. When Jesus finished his work at the cross, he sat down at the right hand of God. That's that place of power. It's the place of authority. It's the place of headship. Jesus, and he sat down. He's not pacing around heaven going, oh no, what did they do? What did they do? He's, he is relaxed. He is composed. Because his sacrifice was, was sufficient. Jesus fulfilled, here we go. Jesus fulfilled the burnt offering. Leviticus 1, he fulfilled the burnt offering. Ephesians 5, 2 tells us, As Christ also loved us, He has given Himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Remember, the biggest, one of the biggest things about the burnt offering, it was a complete burnt, consecrated, the whole thing given to God, cut up piece by piece, and it was a sweet-smelling aroma. Jesus Christ has loved us. He's become a sweet-smelling aroma, sacrifice to God. Ephesians 5, 2. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Leviticus chapter 2. Jesus fulfilled the grain, the first fruits offering. But Christ Jesus now is risen from the dead and he has become the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. And we might add, he's the bread of life. Jesus fulfilled the peace offering in Leviticus 3. We read in Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, people need Jesus. They need to have their peace made with God. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. The, the believer that, that, that knows they're going to go and they, can, they make their peace with God. You know, what does that mean? Lord, I love you. I'm sorry. You know my heart. I'm coming. I remember Jen one time, she was paddling out. I'll spare you the, the long, exciting story at Hokipa for a, for a scholastic surf contest. And she's paddling out, and the waves were giant and just, you know, way bigger than any little girl should be out in. And the lifeguard jet ski was flipping and rolling over in the surf, and the lifeguards are trying to rescue the jet ski. Well, all the little girls, Whoa! the whistle blows. All the little girls paddling out. <laughs> and Jen goes, Dad, I made my peace with God when I got out there, man. <laughs> she, she literally thought, and we thought, I mean, literally, we thought, that's, you know. Guys, he's our peace. And again, we, we come to him because he's, because he's given us peace, not because we're seeking it, but because he is our peace. You can't enjoy the peace offering without first having the burnt offering. And, and, and then there's the sin offering in Leviticus 4 and 5, chapter and, and 3 quarters. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we read, For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus became our sin offering that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus fulfilled the guilt offering, Leviticus 5. He was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification, Romans 4.25. You have made his soul an offering for sin, Isaiah 53.10. Jesus Christ, our offering, in every sacrifice he's seen, He's the burnt offering. He's the grain offering. He's the peace offering. He's the sin offering. He's the guilt offering. He's the ordination offering, as we're going to see next week, the consecration offering. And in, in, uh, in a commentary by, I think his name, is, his name is Jukes. I forget the guy's first name. I wrote down the last name. But he said this, By his one sacrifice of himself, once offered, he has stood in every different relation that man needs as our sacrifice. In everything that we need, Jesus, everything that we need, Jesus has stood as our sacrifice. So you think we can trust God? Look at the offerings. Look at what He's given. We'll close with this, Hebrews 10.10. 10. We have been sanctified. We've been set apart. 
through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I hope you have. I mean, that's what it's all about. If you have been sanctified, if you have been set apart through the offering of Jesus Christ, then once for all is all you need. It's not like you had to keep running back. But we do. Because we find ourselves with, with sin here or a stumbling block there and we come back and Jesus' arms are open. He's the father of the prodigal. But here's the deal. Listen, he has to be your father before you can be a prodigal. If you're lost and you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, then you are not a prodigal. You are just lost. But if you are, are a son of God that is that has gone off sideways and even just chosen, you're a prodigal and the father's arms are waiting. And the father's heart is, is, is waiting more than just his arms. I tell you, nothing like it, that story. And we'll be going to be looking at that actually next week some as we get into this with Aaron and his sons. But let's pray. Father, we come before you and thank you, God, so much. Again, that your offerings, as we see in your word, all your word, all your promises are yes and amen. Lord, your offerings are just the same. They are yes and amen. And we can trust you, Lord, as our sin offering. You've covered us, God. Help us to, to come quickly to you, to confess our sins, because you're faithful and righteous and true and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you that you are that burnt offering, that you gave yourself completely for us. And so, Lord, we want to offer ourselves completely to you. Lord, give us thankful hearts. Lord, I pray that you would Make us those as we would draw near to you and be filled with your spirit. Lord, make us those that would have psalms and songs and hymns and, and rejoicing words of love, Lord, in our hearts to share with one another. Lord, help us to submit to you and to one another in love and see all these things, Lord. See all these things fulfilled that you have for us. Lord, help us not to miss one. And we ask you and we pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.